Well, we're ready for the, you know, long-promised um, analysis of Harold Wright's tone production, and uh, also reading uh, of a monograph that was shared to me, generously shared to me, by Russell Harlow. Russell is a fine clarinet player, a double lip player, a student of Harold Wright, and uh, also uh, who runs a great clarinet website that all clarinetists, but especially clarinetists who are double lip players, French embouchure players, should really look into. Uh, it's called Clarinet Central, very appropri appropriately named. And there you get a real sense of the historical roots of French embouchure playing, and uh, get and you also have some good, actually, audio examples of the really great French embouchure players in France before France, I don't know, went insane and changed to German embouchure in the 1940s or something. I have no idea why they did that. Uh, but nevertheless, the great French embouchure players, and ironically, the French embouchure school uh, really only exists here in America now uh, with the uh, players, uh, well, first like Ralph McLean and then Harold Wright and then all of Wright's protégés. So anyway, let me read some of this monograph uh, and uh, then we're going to discuss that and then we're going to anal uh, analyze the, the picture. So uh, let Grandpa get his glasses on here. Uh, this is the opening, uh, it's called The Accidental Clarinetist and, and I think it's available on Clarinet Comments <clears throat> or Clarinet Central. Uh, but if it's not, I'm sure that Russell will be happy to share it with you. Uh, I'd be glad to share it, but I don't have permission from him at this point anyway. So this is, um, it starts with a quote. Now this is a quote from Harold Wright to him. Quote, look, if somebody put a gun to your head and said, play double lip, you do it, end quote. In my second year in the Utah Symphony in 1973, I switched to double lip embouchure for a variety of reasons. So ironically, I switched about the same time uh, I was going to Yale. I was beginning my second, uh, it was actually the summer before my second year of master's work there. In 1978, there was a need to seek out what Harold Wright could show me. So he'd been trying to play double lip from 1973 to 1978, and finally uh, he decided he needed, wisely decided he needed some instruction. <laughs> so, um, all right. So in 1978, there was a need to seek out what Harold Wright could show me about how to really approach the style. And that's what I'm hoping to share with you, how to really approach the style. And also uh, the proper mechanics, we're going to talk about that. Let me see if I can stop extrapolating. Anyway, I wrote to him and he wrote back saying he could see me on Sundays at Tanglewood and to look him up. So I drove to Massachusetts in my orange and white VW van. I had one just like that. Uh, and then I did just that. That trip from Utah to Tanglewood, Massachusetts gave me a lot of time to think. Why not make life e a lot easier? In our first session, I told him that I decided not to play double lip. He said, then I'm not going to teach you. I said, but it's difficult and it hurts. He said, look, if somebody held a gun to your head and said, play double lip, you do it. That was his way of holding a gun to my head. So I continued. What else could I do? We had five lessons that summer that were to become some of the most important instructions of my career. Now he goes on to, to, um, to delineate and to describe some really important things uh, that I've come by, you know, the deductive process to surmise my own self, but he got it sort of, so to speak, straight from the horse's mouth. So let's go on. Uh, and this little section is, the sound has to be there. The sound has to be there. That's what Wright said to me after he became aware of the fact that he was dealing with a young man who was playing on a mouthpiece that needed balancing. He was playing a Borbeck 11, but it had a really good sound. Yeah, the Borbeck blanks were good. I've had students that had Borbecks, uh, but the facings were often very crooked. 
they had to be corrected, and I did that for several of my students. Um, anyway, uh, the mouthpiece needed balancing, okay, so it, it needed to be refaced into a good symmetrical facing, and the reeds were too hard. If that sounds familiar, if that sounds familiar to you, perk up your ears. He started out with some exercises to strengthen the embouchure and told me, you're playing too hard. With that, he was speaking not only of reeds, but of the way I was using the wind. After a while, I asked him, oh, can I play your setup? He said, nope. After a concert in his shed, this is at Tanglewood, I went backstage and speaking to him and asked him again, can I play your setup? And he said, no. Then I said, but I need to find out what the difference is between my concept of resistance and yours. He said, okay, here. And he handed me his clarinet. I walked to a corner and played it. That was a revelation for me. My impression was that there was no reed at all there. It was so easy. The reed mouthpiece clarinet was so balanced that the sound was just there. Many years of habitual playing made change impossible for me until I experienced a totally different way of making sound. The experience showed me a way out of my habits of playing and gave me permission to do something different. Change wasn't immediate. It took years. I remember I already had a job. Remember I had already had, already had a job to produce, but that was the seed that took root, and eventually created the growth I was looking for. Now, I have to say that, you know, with me and my students that I wanted to get to switch to French embouchure, uh, that they were playing way too hard, and I would hand them my setup, and they would play on it, uh, struggle to play on it, they had to fight their jaws down and everything, and finally they'd get some sound, and then they would hand the clarinet back to me, and I would play it, and it was like they had destroyed the reed because of the massive amount of upward jaw pressure they were using on the reed. Bad, 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 bad. And they were playing very hard reeds, blowing much harder than they should, uh, and and so on and so forth. I won't, uh, you know, go through the litany, at least right now. I'll plan that like litany for later. But anyway, so playing this setup was a, a revelation. Um, Let's see, uh, let's go on. Um, and so this heading is now, and these are just brief paragraphs, but they're very, very important paragraphs. Uh, what is necessary? What is necessary for the sound to be there? When I asked a question in relationship to the softness of the reed, Buddy said, not soft. It has to be well balanced to allow the high register to sing out without having, without having to make it so Make it do so with pressure from the lip, muscles, or jaw. See, what happens is when you play a reed that's unbalanced, uh, when you play into the third register, less and less of the reed can vibrate. So if the reed isn't really finely balanced, then one side of the reed is not going to be really responding uh, like the other side of the reed. So you get often delays in response. This happens with crooked facing mouthpieces too. You really notice it most when you have to play above the staff and especially above the staff softly and especially when you go into the third register. So, so uh, the idea here is that, uh, is that when you're playing that unbalanced reed, uh, then when you get into the third register, uh, the only choice you have because one side is heavier than the other is to use that jaw pressure to to clamp down on the reed through upward jaw pressure and force that uh, uh, heavy side into vibrating. So um, this is what you want to try to avoid and it's what I've been presenting about the importance of reed balancing, fine reed balancing, especially when you play French embouchure. It's really, really important. So no muscle or jaw pressure. The, the note should sing out uh, and just, you know, should just flower right out and color the same as the notes in the lower and upper clarion. The sides of the reed have to be balanced, and that balance has to meet and balance with the facing of the mouthpiece. He gave me an exercise of playing F 
on the top line of the staff and high C, just above the staff, playing those notes. If I relaxed my jaw and the sound sagged flat, he considered that to be unstable, either the mouthpiece or the reed. If the sound remained in pitch, he considered that setup stable, and the sound would be there. In other words, if you slur from F and slur to C, if the sound sagged down, that's the way I understand it, uh, then it's unstable. So the the when the reed is properly balanced and everything, you should be able to play the F and the high C slur right to it in the same place. Now later on we're going to have a video talking about high C. It's a very special note, especially for double lip players. But that's going to be uh, another video coming up uh, soon. Okay. Yeah, I know. Soon is not a time. Okay. Um, uh, so, either the mouthpiece or the reed, okay, so it's unstable. When you mean it, it, either something's unstable, either the mouthpiece or the reed, the mouthpiece can be screwed up or the reed can be screwed up. I remember having a student years ago, and she had uh, actually an old Casper mouthpiece, and I thought, okay, well, those are supposed to be good mouthpieces, but she began to play, and she was really working so hard with her embouchure and stuff, struggling. So... Uh, I tested her equipment, and the reed was totally wacky, right? So I balanced the reed. I worked on the reed and balanced it, and uh, and I couldn't balance it. And then I worked on it again, and uh, another reed. I couldn't balance I couldn't balance it to what I called a minimum standard. So finally I pulled out my mouthpiece gauges, and I said, well, there's your problem. Your mouthpiece facing is completely crooked. So... Uh, it's either going to be the reed and or the facing that are out of whack and it's going to cause you to use the biting upward jaw pressure that's making you work so hard. So I finally, I took the mouthpiece, I refaced it, we had balanced reeds and she began to find out what it was to play without struggling and to produce a clear ringing sound without having to completely uh, get TMJ or whatever they call that. So there's much more to this article. I hope you get a chance uh, to read it. Um, but uh, these points that uh, Russell has made uh, are uh, sufficient right now for this video to go on and begin talking about analyzing the, um, the embouchure because it's very, very critical to analyze this embouchure that you're going to see uh, to analyze it well and, uh, you know, the appearance is deceptive. So uh, let's pull up that, that first photograph. Okay, and as you can see there, this is a picture of a fairly young Harold Wright. He's playing at Marlboro. Um, his, some of his best recordings came at Marlboro as wonderful performances. Um, and uh, as far as I know, many of them are still not available, which is a real tragedy. And I note that in this photograph, Wright is wearing a nice Hawaiian shirt, you see. So he's right in fashion uh, like I was with the Hawaiian shirt I had on yesterday. So um, anyway, there you go. I've always been a trendsetter. Um, anyway, so you can get a fairly good shot of his embouchure there. Um, the angle that he plays at, and so on and so forth. It's not exactly a strict profile, it's, uh, but it's, it's enough so you can really see what he's doing. Now, let me preface this before we take a really close look to say that Mr. Wright has very thin lips, okay? And notice that even in this photo, you can see quite a bit of the red of both lips. So, very little over the teeth. All right, so what I did is I took this into Photoshop and I blew it up. And so here's our second photograph, which uh, the quality is not as good because it's all blown up, but that's neither here nor there. What we get here is a really good, good uh, shot of Wright's embouchure. Now, one thing that's deceptive about it is that it looks like he's got a lot of mouthpiece in his mouth. He doesn't, okay? Uh, there's a lot of layers between uh, what you, the part where you see the mouthpiece and where the actual reed is, how far the reed actually extends. 
and uh, but that's neither here nor there right now. The important thing to see here is that you'll notice that the head really is way up, and you'll also notice uh, that the jaw isn't moving forward. Like for instance, Keith Stein says in his book to, that you bring the jaw forward like a bulldog and you, you bring the teeth, make the teeth even and all that stuff. And uh, most people that do this are single lip players and uh, they take a pretty good chunk of reed in. Now, when you're playing double lip French embouchure, it's a completely different world, all right? I want you to think oboe, okay? Think about the oboe. Now, I've talked to a lot of oboe players, and uh, it was difficult to do, you know, as you all know. People generally avoid talking to oboe players. Uh, but I found some really nice ones, and I asked them about the amount of reed that they took in their mouths playing double lip. And, uh, there, you know, there's some some divergence of opinion there always is, but the vast number of oboists take a very small amount of mouthpiece past the red of their lips. In fact, I've had some oboists say I take the least amount past the red of the lips because the lips themselves are going to be used to control the opening and to control the reed. So if you take a whole bunch of reed in your mouth, uh, you're not going to have that amount of control. One oboist said, taking more reed in your mouth doesn't mean you're going to have more sound. But what it does mean is you're going to have less control. So if you try to play, for instance, double lip like you would play single lip, that is, taking a big chunk of reed in, bringing the jaw forward and all that, uh, you're going to be working really hard. You, plus, first you're going to be playing unbalanced reeds, and then you're probably going to be playing a crooked mouthpiece or I don't know what. Uh, but then taking a whole lot of read in, you you leverage yourself out, out of the ability to to actually get any control of the read and any sensitivity. One of the things you notice in this photograph is that uh, Wright's lower lip is actually behind his upper lip. So instead of the the instead of the lower lip down here and then the uh, upper here, it's it's just the reverse. The, I can't get my thumb in that position. <laughs> uh, the the lower lip is back here, and then the upper is this way. So the fact is, is that go, moving past Wright's lip, the red of his lip, past of it, is a much smaller amount of reed than most people would think uh, that you can use and you can play. Uh, when you play the clarinet, they always say, take more mouthpiece, take more mouthpiece. You get the high, bite down and take more mouthpiece. Uh, uh, what a disaster that is. Uh, okay, so what Wright is doing, the upper lip uh, moves a little into your air by having a little more mouthpiece in the top, and then the back, the lower lip, is right up at the tip of the reed uh, and sensitively controls the reed. And the, uh, so there's not a lot of mouthpiece in the mouth. Now, this gives you an enormous amount of leverage on the reed, an enormous amount of control without uh, exerting so much, so much um, physical effort. It's very sensitive and it's very, very delicate. Once you get your reeds well balanced, and that's why I keep banging away, you've got to balance those reeds really well, then you're going to find out that when you put the tip of the reed and the tip of the mouthpiece in your mouth, you just form your embouchure. When you put the air there, the sound should be right there. It should go boom, get a nice clear sound. The reed's very responsive, get a nice clear ringing sound right off without squeezing, okay? That's a, a habit so many single lip players have, and they can't get out of it, so... They don't get the results even when they get their upper lip under. It's uncomfortable, it hurts, and they don't still don't get the results. They've usually got too much reed in their mouth and, and so on and so forth. I want you to think oboe. I want you to think a very focused, very centered sound because that's what French embouchure playing is really like, okay? Beautiful, concentrated sound. Mr. Wright mentioned that to me once uh, after a concert 
that the Boston Symphony played in New Haven. He talked about how the clarinet was difficult to record because it produced such a concentrated sound, focused sound. And I often wondered, well, you look for equipment. Oh, what can I got a mouthpiece or a reed or a barrel or something that will give me that kind of pristine focus, that beautiful, silvery, concentrated sound that's so beautiful when you hear how I play. Uh, and it ain't in the equipment, folks. The equipment will facilitate it, make it a little easier, but if it ain't behind your nose, it's not going to go into the horn. You've got to reproduce these mechanics. They're going to be, you know, in the particulars, because everybody's a little different here, there's going to be a little divergence in the particulars. But the principles that you're seeing here in this photograph of Bright uh, is, is something uh, that everyone should emulate that's going to play French embouchure. And I'd say the first tendency to, to avoid uh, after, of course, that you have your reed balance and reeds balance and, and that you can just hold the mouthpiece in your mouth. We're going to go over those things in detail. But uh, the first thing um, to um, first thing to avoid is taking too much reed in your mouth because I'll guarantee you, you can get plenty of sound out of the clarinet with more refinement in the shape and more control if you don't take a bunch of reed in your mouth. That lower lip needs to be right there. It'll feel like, you know, maybe it'll feel like to you like they're going to drop off the end of the mouthpiece. Yeah, it may feel that way to you, okay? But all the time I want you to think oboe. Now, you, what the oboe, you know what the oboe sound is like. In the upper register, it's beautiful, okay? I want you to think about that kind of shape in the sound, okay? And some of you are going to have trouble getting rid of the, the what I call the trombone school of clarinet playing. Okay. The cure for that, of, of course, is not just the mechanics, but it's also the concept. So you really need to listen to Harold Wright and listen to a lot of those French embouchure players uh, on a Clarinet Central website because a lot of playing examples and sound examples you can hear. And, you know, to a person, these people have really beautiful, deep, concentrated sounds and plenty of sound, believe me. But it's controlled sound and it's refined. I hear so many players play now, the single lip players, and they, they're basically, you know, uh, you know, the trombone school of clarinet playing, you know, and uh, they play loud, but the sound is not beautiful, it's not refined, it's not, this is what we're looking for first is refinement and control in the sound, and this is the way to go about it, okay? Balanced reeds, not a lot of reed in the mouth, not a lot of reed past the lower lip, and the lower lip being used to sensitively control uh, now you can, and also there's the flexibility, which you don't see here, the flexibility of French embouchure, which means <clears throat> that, that you can roll the mouthpiece in slightly or out, depending on what you're playing. If you play in the high register, <clears throat> maybe you want to roll the mouthpiece in a little more. So, sorry, I've got some congestion here. So, <clears throat> anyway, the, the next thing we're going to do is um, actually... It's kind of embarrassing, but I wanted to show you uh, in actual playing um, about the amount of mouthpiece in your mouth. And d again, it's going to look deceptive, but I got my wife to just pick up my iPhone, which is an iPhone 7. It's not one of those big fancy iPhones now, uh, to pick up an iPhone 7. <clears throat> and, just, um, and I just played through, and by the way, the recording was without any microphone. It's just what the iPhone gives you, so it's not great. But I want you to watch and, and listen um, and watch uh, how much reed I have in my mouth. Now, <clears throat> it's going to look a lot like right. But uh, uh, you're going to think, well, you've got a fair amount of reed in my mouth. No, I don't. I've got about maybe that much reed past my lower lip. But I want you to hear this uh, because I want you to hear that you can play throughout. There's no trouble and you, you actually play into the third register and up to the top of G and A flat and A. You, you can play all the way up there if your reed is well balanced and you're not squeezing, uh, you're not forcing, you're not biting, you're not changing your air. Everything will just go right up if the reed is well balanced. 
Uh, if you take a bunch of mouthpieces in your mouth, you're going to be working, and a bunch of reed in your mouth, you're going to be working a lot, a lot harder than you should be working. So, uh, all right, so uh, here's, the, um, here's the, the little thing from iPhone, but the main thing here is to know that I've only got a small amount of mouthpiece in my mouth, okay? And I still get uh, plenty of sound. You, you just have to trust the clarinet and trust these mechanics. This, this will all work. And, you know, some clarinet players may think this is blasphemy, but think oboe. Think the oboe center and focus in the sound, especially in their second register. And think about making that sound really beautiful and centered and concentrated at its source like great oboes. So you, when you become a French embouchure player, you join people who play with two lips.